Listen to this statement I wrote this morning. One day we're going to stand before God and he's going to ask two questions. The first question is, what did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Now let me tell you what he's not going to ask you. It will not be, uh, what religion were you? I get, I've been a Christian 36 years. Can I just make a statement on Christmas Eve? Thank you very much. I get so sick of our answers being religion when it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Almighty God. Religion is dead. Christ is alive. It's not what religions were you. It will not be what denomination, not what background, not where did you go to church. We were created for a relationship with God, not a religion, not rituals, not rules, not regulations. The second question is, what did you do with what you were given? I'm going to make four statements about the single most impressive, most memorable verse in your Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and the language translates it the only unique one, not another one like him. Uh, there is no such thing as virgin born children, just one. And yet God gave that one unique son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish. And the word believe means to cling to entirely, to trust solely. You don't add him to all your other hopes. He's the only hope. He becomes the object of our belief. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish in and of yourself, apoluma, but have everlasting life. When I read that verse, here's what I wrote. It reminds me of the inspiration of his birth. One of a kind, virgin son of God. And yet when God decided to send him into this world, he sent him to a place of obscurity. If you've ever been to the Holy Land, when you're in Jerusalem, you're only five minutes away from the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a word that translates house of bread. What an appropriate place for the bread of life to be born. Someone says, it breaks my heart to believe that he was born in a barn, and of all places, they actually laid his body in a, a cradle, laid it in a manger, laid it in a feeding trough. Someone said, what an appropriate place for the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world to be born. He was born in Bethlehem. He was reared in another obscure village by the name of Nazareth. And so he was born in a place of obscurity. Think with me for just a moment. You mean God could give his only unique son and he'd be born in a place of obscurity, yet there's probably not a person, hardly, if, of course not in this nation, that has had not heard his name and probably heard his story. We're told there's 1.6 billion people in the world that are yet to have heard his name. Uh, 3,500 people groups, many of them have over 100,000 people in, at least 600 of them, that have never heard his name, have no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we take offerings. It only stands to reason that if we really met him and he's who he says he is, God forbid that we would not be generous in trying to get the word out so that the world would at least have the opportunity to say yes or no. Born in a place of obscurity. Born in a time of adversity. You don't think it was a time of adversity when they heard about his birth? A king did everything he could to destroy him. You're talking about abortion. Hundreds of babies died. in the land of Israel at the time of the birth of Christ. But yet, what inspiration you think? Why would a king kill innocent babies because he hears of the birth of God's son? It must have been a unique birth. We hear of no other infants that were killed as a result of the birth of someone else. Even kings are threatened by this man of obscurity that was born in a time of adversity. What a king! 
But the Bible also speaks not just of the inspiration of his birth, but of the identification of his birth. Listen to what Paul told Timothy. He was writing in the last letter of his life, and he said these words in 2 Timothy 2 in verse 11. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, that speaks of my identification with Jesus Christ. There was a day in my life where I repented of my sins, acknowledged that I had no way in and of my own strength to make it to heaven. I identified with Christ in his death. So the Bible says, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. So I, I'm identified in the fact that I only died with him on January the 7th, 1973. I will live with him forever because of this identification. The Bible says we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. He says, live a life of perseverance. Give your entire life with me. And I'm telling you, when this life is over and you come to heaven, you will reign with me. But if we deny him, he also will deny us. And listen to these wonderful words. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. But there's a third word in this miracle Christmas message, and that is the imputation of his birth. My father-in-law for over 50 years was a public accountant in Wilmington, North Carolina. My wife, in our early days of marriage, worked with him and helped him in his bookkeeping and even learned to do taxes. And imputation is one of those uh, CPA terminologies, an accounting term. And it just simply means that uh, God took what was in his ledger and placed on our ledger. Uh, the Bible teaches, the blessed are the poor in spirit. And what he's saying is, oh, the blessedness when you come to the place to realize that you are spiritually bankrupt, uh, that you don't have anything in and of yourself that makes you merit a relationship with Almighty God. And yet the Bible says that even though we're spiritually bankrupt, the one who owns it all took from his ledger and placed on our ledger. Uh, he dealt with my liabilities by making available to me his wonderful assets. I was bankrupt and he owned the world. And so he put into my account. Paul put it this way, writing to the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God for him. He took my sin and put on Jesus' account and took Jesus' righteousness and put on my account. And I had no righteousness. See, no one can ever go to heaven because they're good enough the only requirement that must be met is that we must know the righteousness of God to go to heaven. And that righteousness, the only way any of us can ever have it is for God to put it on our account. And so we have to acknowledge we don't have it. And one of the reasons we don't, we've sinned and we've separated ourselves from a holy God. And then we cry out to God for mercy. And God in his mercy takes what he has and places it on our account. But then, let me wrap it up by talking about the invitation of his birth. You know, the Bible talks about God's purpose and why he came in the first place. The Gospel of Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You ever heard this statement before? You can't get saved until you get lost. <laughs> you got to know you're lost. Uh, I, I've been places before where I didn't think I was lost. I'd be driving. My wife told me I was lost. And you know what men do when we're lost, don't you? Speed up. 